Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Spring Meeting, brought to you as a special edition of Our Curious Malcolm, the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section's podcast. Virtual Springs Eternal, Friday, April 17th through Friday, May 1st, as we bring to you some of the top programs from the now-canceled in-person spring meeting, as well as new hot-off-the-press programs discussing the most compelling issues of the day. Be well and enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the Virtual Spring Meeting. My name is John Roberti. Today, we're delighted to present yet another great panel, Antitrust, IP, and Trade Wars. And the panel is presented by the Intellectual Property and International Committees. With me today to provide some context is Julie Soloway. Julie is a partner in the Competition Antitrust and Foreign Investment Group at Blake's in Toronto. And she's also the co-chair of the International Committee here at the Antitrust section. Hi, Julie. Hi, John. Julie, what are, what's the panel about today? Today, we're tuning into a very impressive panel moderated by Danny Sokol, where we will explore the intersection between antitrust, trade, and IP law. Our panelists will be discussing how antitrust law interfaces with IP and trade in their respective jurisdictions, the evolution of these laws, and they'll be shedding light on emerging trends for our listeners. Great. Well, why is this topic important? Well, firm practice groups tend to be siloed, whereas we're seeing a rise in multinational mergers that raise legal issues in all area, all of these areas. Recent cases such as Qualcomm and XP highlight the importance of integrating these previously distinct areas and conversely, the risk of not doing so. The panel is important because it provides a comprehensive picture of how antitrust, trade, and IP issues interface with each other from both an enforcement and client counseling perspective. As you'll hear the panelists discuss, each of these areas of law have a unique regulatory framework, rules, and remedies, which don't always reconcile with each other. Our challenge as lawyers is to find the appropriate tools in the toolbox to help our clients understand how these different areas of law could apply to our clients' businesses and help them achieve their business objectives. All right, and Julie, what, what are we hoping to get out of it today? I'm excited to hear from leading practitioners all across the globe, Europe, Asia, Canada, and the U.S., on how we might advise clients when navigating the challenges of antitrust, trade, and IP law. I'm looking forward to learning from their experiences in ways that will help me bring a more comprehensive understanding to these issues. All right, Julianne, I'm excited because I, I, Danny Sokol is always very entertaining. So will you stick around with me and, and, and maybe we listen to the panel and then come back with me at, at the end and we can talk a little bit, a little bit about your takeaways. Is that okay? Absolutely, absolutely. All right, with that, let's send it over to the moderator, Professor Daniel Sokol. Danny, take it away. Thanks, John. So for our particular panel, we have an international cast of characters. Um, in, I'll take the moderator's prerogative of introducing myself and then allow each of them to introduce themselves. So I'm Professor Daniel Sokol of the University of Florida, Levin College of Law. Uh, visiting this semester at our Wertheimer College of Engineering. I'm also a uh, part-time senior advisor at YPK's LLP. Laurent? Thanks, Danny. So, uh, Laurent Rusman. I'm an international trade lawyer based in Brussels. I've been uh, working in the area of international trade law in Europe for over 25 years now. Julie? Yes, thank you. Uh, Shuli Rodell, I'm a partner and chair of the Competition and Foreign Investment Group at Osler, Hoskin and Harcourt in Toronto, Canada. Thank you. Yong Jin? Uh, Yong Jin uh, Chang, uh, a partner at Kim In Chang based in Seoul. Um, I'm co-chair of uh, international uh, trading customs practice as well as um, a competition law practice. And finally, Steve. I'm a partner in the Anna Trust Group of Winston and Strong based in Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you all so much for your participation. 
this is uh, in, in many ways uh, a wonderful time to be having this particular panel because we're looking at the intersection of antitrust law with other types of law. And perhaps at no other time do we really feel this sense of interconnectivity as uh, the present era. Um, so I thought we might begin uh, with a general question that I'll throw out to each of you. Provide an overview, given your particular jurisdictional expertise, um, of how antitrust or competition law interfaces with issues of IP, widely defined, and um, trade. Um, and if you could provide perhaps some specific examples. Laurent, maybe we could begin with you. Sure, okay. So each of these areas obviously has a distinct and a different focus, but certainly I think there are occasions of interface. Um, with regard to international trade rules, we have had competition rules discussed in the framework of those negotiations, but they were never agreed. Um, but with regard to intellectual property rights, we have rules in the WTO created in 1995 through the TRIPS agreement, trade-related aspects of intellectual property. And I, I guess for me, the one example I can think of where all three come together and are doing so in a very current way is in the area of standard essential patents, which are one type of intellectual property where you have national regulators concerned about possible abuse of patent rights from the point of view of competition law. And at the same time, you have cross-border implications in relation to international trade rules. And those trade rules really start with the TRIPS agreement that I referred to, where the TRIPS agreement is basically upholding intellectual property rights, requiring WTO members to uphold those rights. But it does allow for some exceptions. And in the exceptions, you do have issues of national competition law that come into play. Uh, I can go into that in more detail if you'd like, but maybe I just stop here uh, just to say this by way of introduction, that with regard to standard essential patents, you do have an area where you have the trade rules interacting with competition rules, interacting with intellectual property rules. Great, thank you. Maybe, um, Yongjin, we could begin with you, in part because both in the United States and in Asia, we've also been involved in this interface with regard to standard essential patents. Um, but also more broadly thinking about these issues. I wonder if you could give us some opening thoughts. Uh, sure. Um, as Lauren explained, um, competition law interacts with uh, intellectual property rights. And in intellectual trade laws, you know, also interact with intellectual property rights. So each of these areas, uh, while they are distinct um, areas of law, but uh, they are interacting with each other increasingly, especially uh, in recent years. Uh, as you've seen, um, uh, the uh, U.S. trade uh, uh, the frictions. Um, you, know, you have, for example, uh, the Qualcomm's uh, proposal acquisition in NXP. If we think about it, all the other jurisdictions clear the transaction by antitrust authorities, but um, you know, at the height of the tension between the United States and China, uh, the Chinese competition authorities, um, you know, uh, you know, decide not to make any decisions on the transaction. Eventually, uh, the Qualcomm, uh, you know, decide to walk away uh, from the transaction. So. Um, the nature of these transaction involving uh, the Qualcomm and NXP, um, there are you know many aspects of the exercise of intellectual property rights, including uh, standard essential patents. So uh, I think we are seeing uh, the trends of um, you know getting you know, all of these areas involved in more cases. Uh, in Korea, for example, uh, 
the uh, Korean competition law applies to intellectual property rights. There are you know, uh, several cases where the Korean competition law interacts with uh, intellectual property rights. As you can see, uh, the KFTC imposed um, uh, the corrective orders against the Qualcomm back in 2017. Um, the, according to the KFTC, the Qualcomm abused its market dominant position as a holder of SAP for mobile telecommunications standards um, uh, in violation of the friend commitments. So this is one of the areas where the competition law interacts with intellectual property rights. Um, as I uh, alluded uh, earlier, the KFTC also imposed a correct orders in relation to Qualcomm's proposed acquisitions MXP. Uh, they imposed corrective orders on the exercise of intellectual property rights. And there are other examples uh, in Korea. They are all uh, the uh, typical cases where the Korean competition law interacted with intellectual property rights. Uh, and also in relation to uh, the intellectual property rights, the Korea also has a uh, export control rules. Uh, if you uh, want to export uh, the essential national security related intellectual property rights, then you need to uh, you know, obtain explicit consent uh, from the government. So uh, the, in many uh, ways, uh, the Korean competition law and international trade laws are interacting with uh, intellectual property rights. Great, thank you. Surely, from a Canadian perspective, um, we get a lot of press in the United States about competition enforcement in Canada. We hear a lot about Investment Canada Act related issues. We don't tend to hear as much about IP minus the revised guidelines the other year. What's going on in Canada? Um, so the, the focus in Canada is really um, the same as many other jurisdictions where the authorities are looking for the right balance between protecting intellectual property rights um, to incentivize innovation and on the other hand, to balance that against the fact that IP rights um, place the owner in a position where those rights can be used as a basis to um, enhance or create market power. And so, you know, you hear a lot about this in the realm of patents um, and, um, you know, any number of other conduct issues in the intellectual property area. The, the way that Canada comes at this, and it's not unusual is to distinguish between the mere exercise of an intellectual property right and something more than that. So the difference between having a, 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 a patent and, and being able to use it exclusively and then um, potentially licensing and attaching anti-competitive condition to that license. So this comes up, um, you know, from time to time and in, in number of different ways. Most recently, actually last week, there was a, a, a news release from the Competition Bureau that they recently concluded an inquiry when the um, target of that um, resolved the issue on their own in, in the issue there. And this has come up a number of times is um, refusing to provide a sample um, of, of a, a drug to the generic companies. And so, you know, the Competition Bureau is very much on top of intellectual property issues. Um, and that is something that actually, you know, perhaps it's not um, so novel and not so different from other jurisdictions that you don't hear about it, but we hear a lot about it, certainly in Canada. Great, thanks so much. So, um, one, Maybe this is an opportunity uh, for, for, to come back to you and just get a sense from you because you gave us a little bit of teaser if you had more to say. Now that you've seen how some of the other jurisdictions are dealing with these issues, I wonder if we could come back and get a little more depth and flavor uh, to, to some of uh, what, what you hinted at. So to the extent that this is an opera, we've heard your overture, and now we would like to... Uh, 
hear the next act. Okay, so basically you have a situation under the TRIPS agreement where generally the idea is to uphold the rights of the patent holder. There are express exceptions allowed, but there are certain conditions attached to those exceptions. And basically, the use is only permitted uh, without the authorization of the right holder. So it could either be by government or by parties authorized by the government. Only permitted if prior to that use, the proposed user has made efforts to obtain authorization from the right holder on reasonable commercial terms and conditions. And those efforts have not been successful within a reasonable period of time. Okay, you're already getting down into the weeds of uh, lawyer language here with reasonable commercial terms and conditions and reasonable periods of time. But the other point is that the right holder shall be paid adequate remuneration in the circumstances of each case, taking into account the economic value of the authorization. So basically, we, while we would allow the use without the authorization of the right holder, the idea is that the right holder is not simply uh, robbed of his right, but actually gets adequate remuneration. And so the question that comes up then is to what extent, oh, and I'm sorry, I should go a bit further there. This requirement about first seeking the authorization on reasonable terms and conditions is not required where the use would be permitted to remedy a practice determined after judicial or administrative process to be anti-competitive. So here you have an explicit reference in the TRIPS agreement to competition rules. And these competition rules, by definition, since there are no WTO competition rules, are being applied by national authorities in their own jurisdiction. So this is an interesting interplay between the international rules regarding intellectual property rights and national rules regarding competition a law. And of course, there's plenty of room for, for uh, well, disagreement as it would be in a national jurisdiction about the meaning of these terms in specific circumstances. And in the international context, you could understand that because competition rules are not the same across borders, there's even more room for a divergence in opinions. Steve, do you have any additional thoughts on this? Well, I was just going to say, Danny, that the, uh, the intersection of these three has been uh, a very difficult and uh, slow moving, in my view anyway, uh, attempt to reconcile some internal inconsistencies among these three uh, areas of law for at least the past 30 or 35 years. And I think the a failure to include uh, IP uh, in the in the Uruguay round or in any of the rounds uh, of antitrust uh, in in ever since the Havana round of the uh, of the GATT and WTO negotiations has left us with a real patchwork. It is a very difficult area. Uh, and a uh, an area that's that's viewed differently in different territories. One area, one I was going to mention, uh, contrasting the the U.S. and China, uh, is the the view that that some Chinese authorities have taken that the uh, the trips rules uh, do uh, provide, in their view, for a quasi essential facilities approach to forcing the sharing of intellectual property where uh, there is uh, shown to be an anti-competitive effect. And we can put to one side for a moment what has to be shown to demonstrate that effect. Whereas in, in the US, uh, under the Trinco precedent, uh, that is not regarded as the state of the law. Uh, I'll stop there at this juncture. Thanks, Steve. Let me just ask you a follow-up question then. Um, and this is perhaps a nice segue to our next question of how have things changed in the, next, in the last uh, two or three years and 
how do you think things are going to be going moving moving forward? You do a lot of Asia related work uh, in the PRC and elsewhere in in the region. Have, have you seen a shift in the last few years based on this intersection? And how do we think about this intersection from a client counseling perspective? Yes, well, particularly with regard to China, uh, I have seen a greater focus on this area uh, without a clear uh, resolution, uh, particularly in the context of uh, of the uh, standards of central patents and FRAND issues that that we hear about so much these days. This has has brought uh, brought up or has has caused uh, discussions about Article 40 of TRIPS and the the essential facilities question in the context of whether the breach of a FRAND commitment uh, on the licensing of standard essential patents could constitute an antitrust violation. Uh, there is now on the table at least. Uh, as to China with regard to certain authorities in China, uh, an open question of whether that now poses also a trade law question under, uh, as I said earlier, what China views as an essential facilities uh, rule uh, in TRIPS. Uh, there's obviously no uh, agreement on that. This, as I understand it, has been a, a subject of discussion in the current U.S.-China trade negotiations, and antitrust was uh, concerns about the application of the China anti-monopoly law in the IP area was a subject of the 301 reports from the U.S. to China uh, in connection with these negotiations, but round one has not provided any clarity on that, and we will just have to wait and see if, if round two uh, may provide uh, more clarity. Yongjin, maybe we can move uh, to you. From a client counseling perspective, we've seen a lot of uh, action um, as the U.S. has thought about uh, or there have been there have been discussions about renegotiating the Korean FTA. Um, we seem to be waiting for final determination of one part of Fran Wars in Korea. Um, in, in terms of the Supreme Court ruling with regard to the Qualcomm case, uh, I think. Uh, uh, and then there's everything else that you have to do, both inbound and outbound. How do we? understand this from a client counseling perspective for both multinationals doing business in Korea and for Korean companies doing outbound related work? Uh, so, uh, uh, as you correctly pointed out, we have two Qualcomm cases. Uh, one is 2000, uh, 2009, uh, second one is 2017. Um, the KFTC uh, went after uh, the Qualcomm's alleged uh, anti-competitive practices uh, in relation to uh, their, um, you know, licensing practices. Uh, so uh, the for Qualcomm one, uh, the uh, the Korean Supreme Court uh, actually upheld the uh, KFTC's decisions about any compare practices. Uh, the Qualcomm two, uh, which was decided uh, by the KFTC back in, uh, you know. Uh, 2017, uh, that is now on appeal uh, before uh, the Seoul High Court. The uh, the the KFTC is uh, very active in uh, going after um, the the exercise of uh, you know senior essential patents. Um, you know, uh, apart from the quantum matters. Uh, the KFTC made uh, you know a couple of forays into uh, alleged the uh, abuse of uh, you know, standard essential patents. The, uh, the one of things uh, come up in Korea is uh, apart from uh, substantive laws on exercise of a standard essential patents, 
uh, the, um, you know, there uh, is some uh, the issue uh, about uh, the procedural fairness. So, uh, you know, starting from the Microsoft back in 2005, then Intel and then Qualcomm, uh, you know, the uh, success cases, uh, the multinational corporations, uh, they voiced the concerns about, you know, the way the KFTC uh, is investigating uh, the cases. So, you know, for example, you know, uh, the United States um, they invoked a, um, a certain provisions under Korea U.S. Uh, FTA, uh, where uh, the U.S. government, um, the, for the first time in history, uh, invoked a, uh, the provision that provides for the consultation forum where uh, the U.S. government is discussing uh, the competition matters uh, with the Korean government. So there has been, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, ongoing concern uh, about the procedural fairness uh, in the context of the KFTC's uh, handling uh, and our trust matters. So, uh, you know, in terms of the substantive laws, um, you know, but also the procedural uh, the requirements, uh, you know, from multinational corporations' perspective, um, you know, uh, they tend to view that um, the KFTC uh, is um, uh, sort of a, in a way, uh, discriminating against multinational corporations. That perception is uh, something that KFTC is uh, trying to dispel uh, as much as they can, but. Uh, I, I think uh, as a council, uh, when you have a case where multinational corporations are being investigated um, in, in, in connection with the uh, exercise of intellectual property rights, then you need to uh, you know, take into consideration the various angles and the practical challenges uh, you're facing. Let me ask you from a Canadian perspective, so, so much of Canadian commerce seems to be connected to the United States. How has client counseling changed the last few years for both multinationals doing business in Canada and for Canadian uh, firms that are looking to uh, do work, uh, which is, shall we say, more export oriented uh, to, to other jurisdictions, whether the United States or elsewhere? Well, um, the trade has not really been an avenue for, for many years for, or trade remedies has not really been an avenue for many years, decades even in Canada um, for, for um, someone to find redress. Um, and there's also not a lot of private action in Canada, even on the antitrust side, where, where I think in the past number of years with all the um, different negotiations and um, issues in the trade area from, from an antitrust counseling perspective. We see, for example, in merger review where um, you're defining markets, um, you're looking to potential entry and expansion, the changing trade environment certainly has been a factor in the types of um, positions that can be put forward and you know projecting going forward where we're likely to see um, entry and expansion into Canada or um, from uh, international perspective exports from Canada. It's certainly been interesting to um, have that crystal ball. Great. So I wonder then that we'll run from the European perspective, how have things changed? Uh, there, there's obviously been a lot of rhetoric, but in terms of your day-to-day -day practice, in terms of client counseling, how, how do we understand what's going on yeah, in Europe, and how do you explain these salient features to clients? What have been the changes? Well, I would say a basic challenge is just helping clients to understand how trade rules can affect their, their situation. And this is something I, I would say We've seen since the development of the WTO, 
but in parallel with that, the rise of globalization, that traditionally people have thought of trade rules as involving the customs tariffs, uh, maybe the trade defense rules, anti-dumping, anti-subsidies, the enforcement of intellectual property rights internationally was mainly a question of stopping counterfeits at the border. And what I see now growing more and more is that because of globalization, you have the international aspects impinging much more on day-to-day -day business operations. And it, the companies don't have to be very big to be involved in international trade or to be experiencing problems at an international level. But it is something, the first thing I find I have to do is to help clients to understand what trade rules are relevant and how they might be of use to them. Of course, with the current situation where the WTO appellate body has essentially been blocked, it, it gives rise to a particular challenge in that even if you could make use of those rules, the question is whether you would get something out of it at the end. So... Since most of the people in the antitrust section are less familiar with uh, developments on the trade side, could you discuss what you mean by block? Because I think most people don't understand how the appellate body works. Could you just uh, help us to better understand what you mean by uh, lack of remedies at, the, at that level? Sure. So one of the big innovations of the WTO was to introduce an appellate level of review. So you had in the, under the GATT, uh, the predecessor of the WTO, you had one level of uh, judicial, uh, you could say review of a, a dispute, and there was, but there was no basis for an appeal that would be binding on the parties. And so that was an innovation of the WTO with seven appellate body members. And generally what was happening was there was a kind of a consensus that the membership would be coming from uh, different parts of the globe in a representative fashion. But at one point in the Obama administration, the U.S. decided to block further appointments to the appellate body. And that didn't immediately cause the breakdown of the appellate body because there was still a sufficient quorum. You just have to have three appellate body members to decide a given case. So while the, the membership of the appellate body was slowly being reduced as members were coming to the end of their terms, it didn't completely uh, get paralyzed until December of last year, when there was no longer the quorum of, of three uh, to hear any cases at the appellate level. And so now you've had countries, including the EU, well, the region of the EU, who have been trying to find an alternate solution pending the resolution of the concerns of the U.S. Uh, with regard to the appellate body. And basically, the U.S. has done this as a way of forcing other WTO members to consider how the appellate body had been reaching its decisions. And basically, in the U.S. view, going beyond what had been negotiated by the parties. This concern about overreach. So that concern about overreach, I think, is a very nice way to segue into a related question, which is that each of these distinct areas of law um, have their own regulatory style, uh, their own rules, and their own um, uh, remedies. How often do you see... Um, regulatory arbitrage across each of these three distinct areas and you know are companies really manipulating the system i'll let surely you begin sure well I, I think not so much in terms of different forums to seek remedies but we certainly do see um companies raising for example an intellectual property uh, claim as a way to defend against an antitrust concern. A very um, recent example of that was the Toronto Real Estate Board um, was taken on by the Commissioner of Competition for essentially um, denying access to the listings database to virtual uh, 
broker brokerages. And so the one of the arguments that was made by the Toronto Real Estate Board was that they actually had a copyright in the database and therefore were entitled not to um, be sharing any access to the data on that basis, which raises a whole number of really interesting questions about um, big data and IP and, and how antitrust works in that context. But um, the, the, the response to that um, from, from the competition tribunal and on appeal is really that there, there is no, um, you know, whether or not you have copyright in the database is only one issue, but, you know, even if you do, um, attaching anti-competitive conditions to that is more than the mere exercise of that. Um, intellectual property rights. So back then to the distinction between a mere exercise and something more than that, that's really been playing out in these cases. But you certainly do see um, companies seeking to use uh, an intellectual property right in the sort of novel data area as a way to defend against having to share access to the data. So that's certainly something interesting to watch. Thank you. Um, Yongjin, uh, from your perspective, see some of this regulatory arbitrage across different areas. You, you have the distinct pleasure of being our one panelist who actually chairs not one but two practice groups. So you, you probably see the synergies um, of, of uh, having multiple meetings instead of only one set of practice group meetings. But probably you also see the opportunity that if something doesn't work, through one lens, you might reframe it slightly for the other lens. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Danny, um, the, uh, the, for example, um, the after uh, Korea-US uh, FTA renegotiation, uh, as you know, after the, uh, the Trump administration came in, um, the, uh, the President Trump uh, uh, announced um, uh, they're renegotiating the NAFTA as well as Korea US FTA. So um, the the Korean government uh, the uh, was involved in negotiating the Korea US FTA with, with the United States counterpart. Um, the as a result of the renegotiation, which was successfully done, uh, you know, long before uh, the uh, NAFTA 2.0 uh, was successfully concluded. The, uh, as a result of this uh, Korea US FTA renegotiation, um, uh, there is a component of where um, the, the United States provides a, some sort of a steel quota uh, for steel companies of Korea. So, uh, one of the challenges our client uh, was faced with how to allocate. Uh, steel quota among different uh, steel makers in Korea in order to uh, satisfy the steel quota set by U.S. government. So, uh, if you are, um, you know, discussing the potential steel quota like a market allocation, um, you know, among themselves, that would uh, certainly constitute cartel. So. Um, you know, there was a you know uh, you know incredible amount of uh, the counseling involved in order to make sure that uh, they will not get involved in some kind of collusive activities. Another uh, the frequent uh, you know case where uh, we were uh, invited to weigh in on was uh, what you know when you have an ad dumping petition, uh, then uh, petitioners. In the local market, uh, in order to protect the industry uh, of Korea uh, in the relevant segment, uh, they need to uh, interact with each other so that they can uh, file for petition. Uh, according to anti dumping rules, um, you, need, uh, you need to obtain the industry support uh, in order to proceed to the next step of anti dumping actions. So, uh, in some cases, we've seen um, the, uh, these domestic industry participants uh, getting involved in some kind of discussions, uh, you know, to uh, 
make a petition for uh, the Korea as a Trade Commission, which is equivalent of U.S. Uh, ITC. Uh, so we we were you know invited to weigh in on that type of cases as well. So um, the uh, you know between antitrust practice and international trade practice, uh, sometimes um, in order to uh, practice um, uh, trade laws, then you might uh, be uh, inevitably uh, you know, interact with an uh, antitrust law. Great, thank you. Uh, Ron, how, how might we see arbitrage even across different parts of trade agreements, let alone trade in other areas? Sure, so I would say in general, trade law is usually not the first port of calls for companies or sectors seeking regulatory relief in the EU. Uh, with the exception, perhaps, of trade defense measures. Um, with regard to trade agreements, of course, companies are always looking for differences in the, the rules, the substantive rules that have been set up. But in general, the EU tries to maintain consistency among the rules that it's negotiating across agreements. And up until now, well, up until relatively recently, there were not too many agreements with a larger trading partners. Of course, that's starting to, to change, but there the EU has been relatively careful to try to keep rules consistent uh, between the agreements. Uh, I guess the other thing, to come back to what I was saying about the WTO uh, public body situation, in general, the WTO rules are not very precise. Uh, I was citing the language from the TRIPS agreement that spoke about reasonable compensation, reasonable terms and conditions. This is an example where you have, well, you have the relatively general language and you have a relative lack of jurisprudence at the WTO. Uh, while the US may complain that the appellate body has been overreaching, in fact, in relation to the number of rules that are, are at play, there's been relatively little WTO jurisprudence, including WTO jurisprudence on IP matters in particular. But I would say in the EU, whether you would go first for uh, some kind of remedy under IP law or competition law would, would generally depend on, well, it might depend on whether you're on offense or defense, it might depend on whether you think your IP claims are the strongest, or you think there's a basis for claiming anti-competitive behavior in, on your opponent's side. But I would say the trade rules, in my experience, they tend to come in more to support a position that's already being taken in relation to the IP rules or the competition rules. Great. Steve, um, what are the different levers that you can push uh, when, when one lever seems to be stuck? So if your matter is large enough and I guess uh, politically sensitive enough, I think the threat of a WTO action uh, can be uh, an effective and powerful uh, tool. It's probably more powerful as a threat than an actuality. But the, uh, I have had experience with a couple of matters where that has been the case and where the, uh, the possibility of one country elevating what was originally a, a dispute between two companies uh, to the trade level as a dispute between two countries uh, is, uh, is at least a possible uh, strategic consideration that uh, should be taken into account in those rare instances. I, you know, I can, uh, I can say that uh, that has been successful in my view in terms of, of resulting in a greater interest in, in settling in reconciling differences without uh, risking creating uh, either a, a, a trade law case or a precedent in trade law that could be uh, 
could have significantly negative consequences for either or both of the jurisdictions involved. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, all for, for those thoughts. I want to now push ahead, which are what are the emerging trends going forward in this intersection with the following twist, which is um, COVID-19 seems to have fundamentally transformed our world. There's how we might have answered this question in a but for COVID-19 world. There's the additional uncertainty of how we think about some of these interrelated issues in a COVID-19 world. Yongjin, I wonder if we could begin with you. Uh, sort of there's the world beyond COVID-19 where things get quote unquote back to normal. And then there's the world that we live in now where a number for the next say six months to a year, a number of companies need help and uh, they know that each of these different areas of law may offer opportunities for them. How do we do crystal ball gazing into the future in terms of the emerging trends? Yongjin? Yes. Uh, you know, as you all know from the COVID-19 pandemic, um, they are now busy, you know, coping with these new challenges. Um, the, uh, you know, the KFTC, for example, uh, they announced uh, they will suspend, uh, you know, on-spot investigation for some time, uh, trying to give uh, more time uh, or the opportunities to uh, the company subject investigation to, uh, you know, sort things out, uh, you know, in that favor. Uh, you know, I, I, I think uh, the, um, the right before this a COVID-19 pandemic, um, and as you all know and they recognize, um, uh, there was um, you know heightened tension uh, between the United States and China, and then disrupting uh, global value chains and supply chains. So the uh, there was a tremendous amount of uh, uh, the counseling uh, needs for. You know how to navigate these disrupted uh, global value chains. Um, you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, trade laws, um, that requires um, a significant amount of work on the rules of origin issues. Um, you know, because we are, uh, you know, kind of in the web of a proliferation of the FTAs, and we have a different. Uh, the rules on rules of origin. So uh, our trade group was extremely busy, uh, you know, dealing with that. I think, you know, in, in the future, uh, you know, I think that because of the uh, uh, sluggish economy, uh, if we don't have a, a near-term uh, rebound of the economy, uh, then, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, this, uh, the, you know, uh, a tremendous tension we we, we saw, uh, you know, uh, prior to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, might be uh, a bit uh, uh, mitigated. Uh, then, uh, I, I think uh, you know, I I'm hopeful. Uh, you know, I, I I'm I'm I may be wrong, but I'm hopeful that uh, this um, you know uh, you know abnormal uh, kind of the uh, you know situations involving. Uh, international trade uh, might be subsiding, and then we are getting back to uh, the business as usual. Uh, the last year, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the Japan, uh, you know, imposed a export control on uh, the Korean companies. Uh, that was unprecedented. Um, you know, that is a following the model of the United States uh, imposition export. Uh, of the export control on the Huawei and other Chinese companies. So uh, this is, uh, that was an extraordinary uh, measure by the neighboring countries. You know, I hope that, you know, such a abnormalcy uh, will disappear after uh, the week epic to normal. Thanks. Right. But what about you? <laughs> How do we predict what's going to happen uh, from a client counseling standpoint, either with regard to ordinary matters or, uh, shall we say, health pandemic matters? <laughs> sure. Well, 
Personally, I think, again, we saw, we've seen some trends in reaction to globalization over the last few years, which I have the impression the pandemic is uh, in some ways exacerbating. So while you have some people saying, well, we have to be extra careful to keep open borders, for example, for medical equipment and machinery, I think a lot of people are saying across the economy, because we're seeing such a slowdown in activity, that we need to be even more careful that unfair trading practices are properly addressed and that uh, takeovers, <clears throat> for example, merger and acquisition activity is not improperly uh, subsidized by third country governments. So I think there are different reactions, but I think there is overall a nationalistic uh, type of reaction that would favor domestic employment and innovation that has already been going on, but I think will grow even stronger with this epidemic. I'm not taking it aside, I, that's just my impression. With regard to the WTO, I think we've been already entering into a period of stock taking and retrenchment with the way the US has approached the appellate body in particular. And I think it is a question of whether other countries will come around to seeing the US position uh, that there are some serious reforms that are needed. I think in the EU, we've been kind of trying to straddle between uh, the alliance with the US and, on the other hand, uh, very strong openness to international trade in general, and in particular, uh, the importance of trade with China. So the question, one question for me is, what will it take to get a new round of WTO, serious WTO negotiations going and will it be preceded by a continuation of unilateral measures until the point where finally everyone agrees that the need for multi, uh, an improved set of multilateral rules is even greater than the need to do unilateral land grabbing, as I would call it? Great. So, surely we're, we're told typically that Canadians are nice. Uh, the future, therefore, has to be nice on the Canadian perspective, right? Yeah. Well, you know, what, one thing that I've been thinking about is, you know, as you see um, some companies thriving and some companies really not thriving at all, and with many um, people needing to reinvent themselves, I wonder whether um, there'll be a greater uh, sort of flexibility on the part of the government in looking at whether to um, re-enter some areas with regulation where there's been much more hesitation to do that. So very good example, and this is um, an area that uh, antitrust authorities have been um, thinking about for the past number of years all over the world, is the knowledge-based economy, big data, and do you um, mandate that companies that are in a, um, in a position of I mean, you could call it market power, you can call it um, in a position of being advantaged by having access to data, should they be mandated to give access to that data or to a platform um, to uh, companies that may need that in order to thrive? So, you know, is a platform or is a collection of, of data a, an essential facility the way that we used to think about you know, telephone lines and railroads. And, and so there's been a lot of discussion, certainly in Canada, about um, it, should we be treating these kinds of, um, you know, platforms, databases as an essential facility. And certainly um, what the Competition Bureau has said about it is, you know, the, the law is there. We don't need to create a new law to deal with um, the knowledge-based economy, but there has been, I think, a hesitation to really do anything about it with the, again, going back to let's not chill innovation, let's not prevent companies from growing, providing consumers what they need. But I do wonder now with the uh, post-COVID-19 world and the economic situation we'll find ourselves in, especially if predictions are true that we're all going to be even more um, connected through technology um, reliant on on the big data companies, whether we will see actually a tendency to um, wade in a bit more 
with regulation or other um, mandated licensing, whatever you'll see. So that that will be something interesting to keep an eye on for sure. Steve, any thoughts about the future, um, including where can we get premium rolls of toilet paper in the DC area? I'm afraid I can't help you with that. Nobody can. The uh, the future, uh, as Yogi Berra said. Well, it is a it was a difficult enough thing to predict before the coronavirus uh, destruction of the economy, but post coronavirus during during the uh, rebuilding area the era that we're going to be in, I think uh, I think there's going to be a lot of strain on uh, both the uh, concerns of about the kinds of uh, nationalist uh, pushes. Uh, the 5G area, I guess, has uh, has been the uh, highest profile example of this with regard to China and the U.S. Uh, or the U.S. and the rest of the world, or China and the rest of the world, depending on what side you're on. Uh, and and this is obviously something that's continuing to play out. I think the um, the questions, the need for a a trade body uh, that incorporates meaningful antitrust rules and meaningful uh, intellectual property uh, rules has never been greater and will con- will only increase in terms of the um, the importance of having a system or trying to build a system that can resolve these, the, uh, the extraterritorial uh, nature of the, the, Korean, the Korean Fair Trade Commission order in the Qualcomm matter in terms of, of one jurisdiction being able to dictate, for example, licensing terms or royalty rates in particular uh, for uh, certain patent deemed essential uh, it is raises the stakes in my view uh, in terms of not having the uh, intergalactic court to uh, to submit your case to to get it resolved once and for all everywhere and for all time uh, which is what parties want uh, they don't want disputes they don't want endless uncertainty and unfortunately, the current system uh, seems to be providing that. One can only hope, and I heard Jung Chin's optimism, so I guess I'll, I'll uh, tag along and, and say I, I'm hopeful that, that this disruption in the, in the economy will give a push to all countries to find a way to the table to, uh, again, address these issues in a way that really is increasingly important to all countries uh, now that uh, intellectual property in particular is uh, a an extremely valuable part of the economy of more and more countries and more and more countries are both implementers and uh, owners of uh, patents and other intellectual property that are valuable worldwide. Maybe this is an opportunity for me to have each of you react to each other. Uh, Certainly, we've heard different prognoses about both the present and and future. Um, This is an opportunity to push back uh, on on some of what you heard. Maybe I'll just open it up. Uh, Surely raise the issue that maybe increasingly some issues of uh, big data uh, and essential facilities will come back. Certainly essential facilities is something both trade law and competition law around the world know well, um, as well as IP law. What of this prediction that we might be seeing more of this, that, that the TWIB case in Canada portends more aggressive this on the part of enforcers potentially on on this topic does anybody maybe want to weigh in on on the impact of digital issues going forward 
Well, Danny, I might say from the EU perspective that it seems there is a struggle to do this, that I think EU countries are also interested in, in having some kind of control over the, the size and power of these companies which have the control of the, the databases. I think what it comes down to, though, is a question of political willingness to challenge the U.S. when it comes to at least the U.S. companies who are in that dominant position. And there, so far, I haven't seen uh, quite the level of unity I think would be required for the EU to really get this, to really get a handle on this. Uh, but, you know, this is not unusual <laughs> that we talk about a lack of unity in the EU because this is the perennial complaint about how the EU deals with China as well, that China has seemingly learned from the U.S. how to divide and conquer Europe. <laughs> Uh, divide and conquer Chinese strategy. Is this something that we've seen um, elsewhere? Steve, uh, you've spent a lot of time uh, dealing with uh, Chinese competition law issues. Yes, uh, certainly uh, we have seen this and it is a uh, divide and conquer is the, is the right term, I'm afraid. And I think, uh, again, in the absence of uh, effective global rules, this is going to continue to be uh, the political game that will be obviously available to each country. And if we have national champions or whatever you want to call them, favored country, companies and favored technologies uh, from the standpoint of, of national interest uh, in, in a given country, uh, it will continue to use political power uh, and political tools to try to um, push the, um, the application and interpretation of these vague rules that we have in a way that, that benefits or favors uh, their own interests. That's obviously natural and uh, hard to complain about in the abstract, but in in terms of having a global, a workable global uh, trade order and legal order that's predictable and fair, uh, it is not. Uh, it is suboptimal, as the economists say, uh, and tremendously harmful. I think in terms of of depriving uh, consumers of uh, efficient outcomes and also citizens of these countries of efficient outcomes with regard to their economies. Youngjin, um, we know that um, there's a new digital task force in Korea on the part of the KFTC. Are these kinds of digital issues ones that uh, increasingly you think will play a role uh, for, for your multinational clients uh, in, in Korea? Yes, yes, Danny. Uh, the, uh, the KFTC established, uh, you know, IHCT uh, task force team where you have a uh, multiple subdivisions, including semiconductor division, uh, platform subdivision, and online subdivision, intellectual property subdivisions. So, uh, the the new chairwoman uh, uh, who was inaugurated uh, last September, uh, she was uh, putting uh, a tremendous amount of emphasis on the digital uh, platform uh, related enforcement. So, uh, you know, I, I think um, the uh, the KFTC uh, is uh, particularly interested in understanding the market. Um, and the trying to ascertain what are the issues that would uh, prevent, uh, you know, new startups from, um, you know, uh, you know, being successful. Um, they, they, uh, they seen, uh, you know, many instances where they, uh, the global platforms are stifling competition, uh, in, in, in the digital market. Of Korea, so 
uh, I think um, the Kiptis will continue to, uh, you know, uh, you know, spend a lot of time uh, in enforcing competition law uh, in relation to uh, digital platforming and big data. Uh, you know, because uh, the Korean, uh, you know, economy right now uh, is uh, rapidly moving into a digital economy, uh, just like in any other jurisdictions. So uh, that is uh, sort of a part of the industrial policy where the Korean government's putting a lot of emphasis on. Uh, that we have um, the you know, very strong uh, semiconductor industries, uh, which uh, account for a more than uh, 60 to 70 percent of the global market uh, in the semiconductor uh, market. So uh, that is a government push in terms of the industrial policies. And then there is a, you know, competition policies where uh, the the Korean competition authority are trying to make sure that there should be effective competition in the digital market. Great. Great. And I think with that, we're going to wrap up. I want to thank very much our participants from around the world um, in what are trying times for everybody listening in. Uh, but it seems to present many new challenges and opportunities. John, back to you. Thanks, Professor Sokol. Julie, let's send it back to you. What was what was your first big takeaway from uh, today's program? Well, first, uh, I just wanted to thank Danny and all of the panelists for doing such a great job. Um, it was a very insightful session, and we enjoyed hearing about your experiences. So my first big takeaway was how each of these three distinct areas are so difficult to reconcile or, or interface with each other. And I was struck by how much we are really still looking for the right balance, for example, between protecting IP rights on the one hand uh, to incentivize innovation and the fact uh, that IP uh, can be exclusionary conduct and, and, and how that interfaces um, with the other areas. And um, in the trade law area, I was reminded how trade, the application of trade law varies a tremendous amount internationally to the extent it can be used as a useful tool. Trade law today still is mostly about state to state and diplomatic interaction as opposed to private action. So I was reminded about how these pieces of the puzzle don't always fit together. And it creates it creates a thicket um, to try to work through as a as a practitioner. Good insight there, uh, Julie. What's your second takeaway? The panel raised some interesting issues regarding concerns about procedural fairness relating to the enforcement of antitrust matters in certain jurisdictions, where trade and other non antitrust considerations are likely making their way into antitrust decisions. Companies in these cases have limited avenues of redress where the antitrust laws are not applied in a fair and transparent manner. It's procedural fairness is often um, uh, difficult to assess and and you know bound up in culture. So that's another really important takeaway. Uh, what one more takeaway from today's panel? Well, COVID nineteen. Uh, the, the pandemic has presented new challenges for regulators across the globe, and there's some uncertainty in how we think about these issues in this context. Now, more than ever, I believe there's a need for a trade body that will incorporate meaningful antitrust and IP rules in its consideration and decisions. Julie, very, very helpful. Thank you. Before I let you go, could you just tell us a little bit about what the International Committee is up to and maybe how young lawyers and others can get involved? The International Committee provides fresh thinking and analysis of competition, consumer protection, and privacy issues in a way that reflects this section's collective expertise. We monitor, analyze, and comment on significant international policy issues in the merger and conduct areas and insist assist the development of private sector competition, consumer protection, and privacy associations in other jurisdictions 
who calls for and developed balanced policy in practice. Um, we always welcome new membership. To join us, please reach out to me, Julie Soloway, my co-chair, Tom Collins, or vice chair in charge of membership, Lucia Ojeda Cardenas. Julie, thank you. It's a pleasure and thank you for giving us such great context. You're very welcome. And I also want to thank uh, the panelists, uh, prof particularly uh, Professor Sokol, for all their preparation and, and really good work. And most importantly, I want to thank our members, those listening. Thank you for sticking with us during this difficult time. Thank you for joining us for this panel. Please be safe and be well, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening to this 2020 Virtual Spring Meeting Edition of Our Curious Amalgam. It is produced and shared around the globe by the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent those of their employer or other organization. If you like what you heard and would like to become a member of the ABA Antitrust Law Section, visit us at ambar.org slash antitrust to learn more. If you have feedback for the podcast or are interested in participating in a future episode, please reach out at Our Curious Amalgam at American bar.org. Until next time, thank you for listening.